Hello there, welcome to 1A slash 1B variational principles. It's 1A because I expect most of you to be 1A students at the courses examined in 1B. Well, it was over a year ago in late March or early April um, 2020, when um, I was told that I couldn't give this course in 2020 um, in person has to be online. You know, we were all new to the concept of, of Zoom and cameras and all that. So I got myself a pile of books and the mobile phone camera. And um, you know, I would put some paper underneath the camera and, and lecture, hoping that by mid-May, it's so mid-May a year ago, we'll be all back in the lecture room. I think in my darkest dreams back then, I would not imagine that the year on from, from there, I would still be lecturing in front of a computer, but maybe with a different technology. I will be releasing my lectures um, possibly on the day um, of when they be, should be taking place. So Friday, um, Monday and Wednesday. And just after each lecture, I'll put um, I'll put the lecture notes online. And you know, if, if come May 17th, um, if they let me anywhere near a real lecture room and you there, I'll, I'll look, then I'll be delighted to, to meet you in person. But the, the chances of that are, um, well, small. Variational principles. Um, well, it's, 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 it's a course which brings up pure and applied mathematics together with theoretical physics um, in, in one. And, and unlike many other um, areas of mathematics, it can, it can be traced back to a, a single problem or a question asked by um, Johann Bernoulli um, in um, 1696. So, um, I'll start off today telling you um, about a bit of a history and giving you the motivation for the subject. Um, so it will be an example of a problem which we'll later regard as a variational problem. Um, and this goes under the name of the brachistochrome problem. Um, the problem is this, you have a particle which slides on a, on a wire under influence of gravity between two fixed points on the plane. And the, the question is to, um, the problem is to determine the shape of the wire, which gives the shortest travel time um, um, if the particle is starting from rest. So the particle slides on the wire. under influence of gravity. I'm um, 
um, assuming that the particle is starting with zero velocity, so starting from rest. We can, um, well, to turn this into a problem we will eventually be able to solve, let's, let's adapt some coordinates um, to this problem. It's, you know, it, it's a problem on the plane. So I'll have the, the y-axis going up and the x-axis going to the right. Um, let's say that I'll choose the point A to be the origin. And point B to be somewhere on the plane. So the point A has coordinates x1 and y1, which I see choose to be 0, 0. Point B will have coordinates x2 and y2, which with our have convention um, will be negative. And what I'll do now is I, I contemplate all possible shapes um, on all possible curves, smooth, let's say, curves joining these points A and B. So maybe the curve will look like this. Um, or like that. And I aim to compute the, the travel time between A and B along all those curves. And the Assertion is, if this problem has a solution, that there is some optimal shape of, of, of the wire, so some preferred curve, so that the travel time between A and B is minimized along this curve. The problem was posed by um, Johan Bernoulli. in 1696 and he he posed it as a challenge to that maybe that's how um, mathematics was done at the time he posed it as a challenge to his contemporaries he's then um, went on to solve it his brother Bernoulli's were a mathematical family his brother also solved it the the story has it that Johann's solution was wrong, so he tried to um, sell his brother's solution as his own. The problem um, eventually ended up in the hands of Newton. Bernoulli must have sent it off to Newton. Um, the Newton, the Newton solved it in one night, um, and he he commented. Is. He said, I do not love to be pestered and teased by foreigners um, about mathematical things. Um, and he posted his solution without signing it off, but the solution was recognized because of Newton's style. Anyway, I'm, I'm not going to solve this problem today. Um, we'll, we'll come back to it in, in a couple of lectures, but at least I'll set up the, the mathematics behind the solution. So we are interested in the, the travel time. Um, call it capital T. And it's an integral of dt. Um, so it's an integral between these two points, A and B of dl, where dl is the infinitesimal line element, um, divided by the velocity, which depends on x and y. Okay, well, how do we make this more concrete? Uh, we're going to use the energy conservation principle, so the kinetic energy, um, plus the potential energy is a constant. Mm. 
The um, kinetic energy is a half of mv squared. The potential energy is mgy. And this is the formula for the total energy at any point during the motion. Well, it has to be equal to the initial energy, which is just the potential energy, because we're starting from rest. This is mg y1, but we have chosen our coordinates so that y1 equals zero, or so that's zero. So we can, we can solve this relation for, um, for v, for the velocity. This gives us v to be a root of 2g, where g is the earth gravity, times minus the square root of y. And this I substitute for my formula for time. So when I do that, I find that I need to minimize t, which depends on the choice of a function y of x, that's the notation I use for it, t in square brackets of y, which is one over a root of two g. And then I integrate from zero, which is my x1 to x2. Then the, the line element, um, together with the Pythagoras theorems gives me um, square root of one plus y prime squared um, divided by the velocity, which is this square root of minus y, because I, I took a square root of one over two g outside the integral dx. And this, um, problem I have to solve subject to y of zero being zero. And y of x two being fixed number, let's call it y two. Okay, so you're, you, know, you, you can try some functions y equals y of x, which go through zero and x to y two. And for each choice of a function, if you compute the integral, you will compute this time of arrival. And you know, it will depend on the function. Is there a function um, where this time of arrival is shortest and you know, how to find it? It's not clear how to do it. It's, it's not a problem which you know, is posed as a differential equation. Well, that's first example. The second example is motivated by geometry. Um, it is a problem of finding geodesics. These are, um, these are the shortest paths. Um, in our case, shortest paths of two points on some surface. not geodesics, but just one geodesic. Shortest path gamma between two points on a surface, sigma. And assuming that such a shortest path exists, when we'll talk about geodesics later in the course, we'll see, and, and later in 1B geometry, we'll see that these geodesics do not always exist. Anyway, how, how would we set up this problem? Let's take 
the surface to be just a plane, so sigma equals R2. Um, on the plane, we can compute the distance um, along each path by um, you know, approximating the paths by straight line segments and using Pythagoras theorem and summing these segments. So Pythagoras theorem holds on the plane. A plane where Pythagorean theorem holds. And let's adopt a coordinate system on this plane. Pick A to have coordinates x1 and y1, and then B will have coordinates x2 and y2. We can then calculate the distance from A to B along um, any path. But unlike in the previous example, for that one, we or most of most of you can guess what the solution is going to be. So we, we would expect the shortest path between A and B on the plane to be um, a segment of a straight line. Well, if we didn't know this solution, then we'll say that the distance along any curve gamma joining A and B is of the form capital D, which depends on Y, Y as a function of X. That's an integral from A to B of infinitesimal line element. And that's an integral from x1 to x2 of um, 1 plus y prime squared dx, where we have chosen to think of y as a function of x rather than x as a function of y. And in, in this geodesic problem, we seek to minimize D um, by varying the path between points A and B, but having the points fixed. Okay, so, so there are two different examples, but they, um, well, they have something in, in common. Um, we want to minimize, or sometimes we want to maximize, um, an integral where the integrand depends on a priori unknown function. So let's pin down the mathematics. We aim to minimize, um, but in other problems we will for maximizing an object of the form capital F of Y, um, which is an integral from X1 to X2 of some little f, which can depend on X, Y of X, and Y prime of X. Well, prime stands for a derivative, dx. Let's give this formula a number, 0.1. And we, we want to you know, extremize this, um, this object among all functions with fixed ends. So functions such that y of x1 equals y1 and y of x2 equals y2. And otherwise, y is arbitrary.
Now, what, what sort of object is it, this not point one? It, it, depends, it depends on the function y, which, which we don't know, and it produces, um, well, a number at the end of the day, if we can perform the integral. So this is a function, but not on the space of numbers, not on the number line, but it's a function on the space of functions. Um, something like that is called a functional. Not point one is a functional. Um, a function on the space of functions. So in uh, functions, you know, from analysis, um, have a number line or, or a space as a domain and, um, and another number line um, as a range. So ordinary functions take numbers um, to numbers. Well, functionals take functions to numbers. Um, an example of um, an example of a functional is um, is an area. So for example. Area. So I'll, I'll have um, I have two points on the x-axis. I have some function, and I'm interested in computing the area um, underneath the graph. The function is y of x. And to any function y of x, I'll associate the area under the graph Well, in, in this case, I, I just need to integrate y between x1 and x2. So in this case, um, this f of x, y, and y prime just equals to y. In the, um, in the, in the geodesic problem, I, um, I took a curve, which is described by a function, and, the, um, and I'm aiming to compute the length of this curve. That's my functional. So that's one example. Another example is a map from a curve to its length. Well, there is f of x, y, and y prime is one plus y prime squared. That's what we need to integrate um, to give us the length. Now, um, well, now I can demystify um, some of the terminology in the title of this course. So, so um, we will um, you know, we'll do calculus on these functionals, calculus on the space of functions, and that's called calculus of variations. Um, the problem of calculus of variations is finding extrema, minima, maxima, sometimes subtle points of functionals on spaces of functions which need to be specified um, a priori.
extrema of functionals. On spaces of functions. Well, I'll need some, um, or I'll use some notation along lines. So the notation has to do with what function spaces will work with. We'll, um, you know, we specify a functional, and we have to say what functions we allow to compute this function alone. This notation, I hope, will follow your 1A analysis notation. Um, I'll say that C of R is the space of continuous functions on R. Then um, CK of R will denote a space of function with continuous k derivatives. Sometimes I'll use the following notation, CK, um, alpha beta of R, well, that will be a space of functions with continuous k derivatives uh, such that f of alpha and f of beta are both zero. Functions with um, fixed values at endpoints. And, you know, it, it'll be important. I mean, this course is, you know, this course is um, offered, so to say, by DAM. So those who um, those who subscribe to, um, you know, division into pure and applied mathematics might want to call this applied. Um, and nevertheless, you know, a round of rigor is, is is necessary, and one one bit which we'll have to be careful about is the need to specify the type of the function space beforehand, before we start computing these functionals. So we need to specify the function space. Beforehand. That is before we start extremizing the functional. The kind of rigorous um, take on, on, on that, this analysis on the space of functions is called functional analysis. So a kind of use of variation is, is an area within yet a bigger area, functional analysis, which um, you know, depending on the year, you might or might not be able to take in, um, in part three. A branch of functional analysis. Um, C part three. It's the kind of analysis on the space of functions. The space of functions. Um, if you think of it as, as a vector space, is an infinite dimensional space. So there are lots of subtleties which which you um, you'd not have seen or appreciated in analysis one or even analysis two. And the kind of comparison is analysis one um, that's the analysis on the number line.
Okay, so I, I, I said, well, I said what calculus of variations might be about. The, the, the course is not called calculus of variations, it's called variational principles. Well, what are those? That's the, the name of this course. These are principles in nature, nature broadly defined in this context, where the laws follow from extremizing functionals. might have nature with capital M, depending on your philosophical perspective. Or the laws follow from extremizing functions. Let's, um, let's look at examples of variational principles, which we'll um, discuss later in the course. Example, not point three, the Fermat's principle. Um, this principle says that the light between two points travels along paths, paths which require least time. Another example, famous example um, of a variational principle is the principle of um, least action. Um, to to set this up, um, we'll we'll need two kind of ingredients: uh, the kinetic and the potential energy. So the principle will be concerned with the motion of a particle in space. Let's say that um, um, let's say that capital T. Uh, I called capital T time before, but let, but, but I'll, be, I'll be using it for energy um, and using this principle. Capital T is the kinetic energy. Um, for example, in, in a, for a particle moving in R3, particle with mass M, this will be M x dot squared over two using vector notation and v um, is the potential energy and this potential energy for oops 
for a particle moving in R3 is just given by a function. Um, we, can, we can think of this not in R3, but in any number of dimensions. Well, then, in terms of this kinetic and potential energy, we define a functional, which we associate to a path. So a functional path um, in Rn is defined to be an integral from T1 to T2 of the difference between the kinetic and the potential energy integrated along a parameter on this path, which we often identify with time. So we have space, which in applications to everyday physics could be R3, but it, it could also be another space, which would be Rn. Um, and we have two points corresponding to the values of the parameter along the path T1 and T2. And we look at all possible paths between these parameter values aiming to select the path along which this um, functional, which is called the action, um, is minimized. So this is called action. And the principle of least action is that the, the action is minimized along the paths of motion, given the potential and kinetic energy. Action is minimized along paths of motion. So uh, in, in the kind of examples I gave in brackets, if the kinetic energy is the standard one, mx dot squared over two, and the potential energy is given by, um, um, by potential function, then these paths, you, you know from dynamics and relativity course, these paths are solutions to Newton's equations. Mx double dot um, equals minus the gradient of the potential. So what, what, what should be the case is that these Newton's equations should follow from the principle of, of, of least action by extremizing the action function. Well, you can, you know, if, if you think about it um, a bit, as, as people did and still do, you'll find it to be a rather kind of attractive approach to, to mechanics, to laws of physics. And um, Leibniz, who was aware of this principle, um, had the following um, kind of perspective of, on, on, the, on this principle of least action. Leibniz take. Leibniz is take on example not point four was this he said we we live in the best of all possible worlds Why? Well, because you know, nature, given this concept of, of energy, uh, which is then turned into action, nature uh, extremizes this action functional and chooses the most economical path. So this, um, you know, this was taken over and is still taken over by philosophers and, and theologians, and um, it might take you from science to theology. Uh, 
I should um, emphatically emphasize that this is not, you know, this um, as attractive as, as this might be, this is not part of this course and this should be avoided. So I, I present the warning site for you. Not because it's rubbish, but just because it's not going to be covered in this course. Well, another great scientist who expressed a, you know, a, a view on this least action principle was the most recent physicist, Richard Feynman. Feynman's take on um, example four. Um, Feynman's interest was um, quantum physics and he claimed that within quantum physics um, th this principle is wrong. This is wrong. Feynman said. Um, in quantum theory, it turns out, the motion takes place along all possible paths with different probabilities. If you're interested in, in this perspective, you'll have to again wait um, uh, for part three and take quantum field theory course where um, Feynman's approach known now as the path integral approach um, is, is I think um, lectured. So see part three, quantum field theory. Again, um, so for, for a different reason, uh, I, I'll not be, I won't be covering Feynman's perspective in this course. So what, what will we do? This course, um, I'm going to um, present necessary conditions for um, you know, extrema of these functionals in the form 0.1. And this necessary condition will be given by um, what we'll call the Euler-Lagrange equation. Necessary conditions for extremum of not point one. Euler Lagrange equation I'll be giving loads of examples um, varying from geometry Um, physics. We'll look at problems with constraints.
for example, to maximize the area given a fixed length of a perimeter. So we'll be maximizing or extremizing functionals subject to some additional constraints on these fun functionals. E, G, maximize. the area given a fixed length of perimeter um, we will also the end of the course um, look at um, sufficient conditions for this um, extrema to be minima or maxima. That's you know it's very interesting, but the more advanced part of the subject known as the second variation. Second variation. Some sufficient conditions. or minimum or maximum rather than a subtle point in the space of the functionals. Um, well, what, what books or sources could you be using? The, the, the classic, which is hard to beat in terms of its of clarity and the combination of rigor with um, with, with, with examples and, and, and easiness is um, a book by Gelfand and Fomin. It's first written in Russian, translated into English. You should have it in your college libraries if you have access to those. Um, it's called Calculus of Variation. Maybe variations. And there are some dumped lecture notes online. For example, by Paul Thousand. Um, but then, you know, I aim for these lectures to be self-contained. Um, if you follow, um, if you follow um, Paul Townsend's notes, then you'll be, um, well, don't be alarmed or disappointed or upset if you find that my notation is different and, and the order uh, which I'm going to take, notation is only somewhat different, it's not a big deal the order to things I'll take will be different, uh, but, but the content um, is very similar. So different order, but similar content. Um, as Okay, that's, um, that's, that's the end of today. I'm going to you know, see if it's recorded. It hasn't, I start again. Um, and I'll see you or you'll see me on Monday.